What's with this stuff of pushing uh, erectile dysfunction drugs for prostate enlargement? So I guess one of the one of the prostate one of the erectile dysfunction drugs actually has an indication for BPH. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? That seems weird to me. Right. Well, it is a little weird. Um, Tadalafil, which is Cialis in the daily dose, um, has been approved for use treating both conditions, ED uh, and BPH. And um, we have a pretty good idea of how ED is impacted by these drugs. They're, they're blood flow drugs. We don't totally understand why BPH should get better with these drugs. The only reason it's Cialis and not Viagra, for example, is that the half-life of Cialis allows for it to overlap on a daily, you know, daily dosing schedule. So here, my overall take on this, Everybody would love this drug if it was if it was super good, right? But uh, but in fact, um, mostly it's super expensive and it's super expensive, uh, eight or ten bucks a day, and and very little um, guarantee of insurance coverage. You know, we have to write some letters and go to bat, and in the end, you know, it's just it it feels like a bunch of wheels being spun with with not the outcome that we had hoped. So uh, these drugs are not as effective. This right. particular drug is not as effective as alpha blockers. Yeah. Um but it it gets the erectile dysfunction issue. Is it know? possible that when you're you're let me see. I don't need to speak in code. <laughs> is it possible when your penis works better, you suddenly think that your urinary flow is better? Yeah, I, I mean, maybe. Maybe it's psychological. Maybe there's some unknown <laughs> physiology going on. I, I absolutely know, we know from studies done in the 1990s that that as men get more urinary symptoms, um, or as men's erectile function changes, their urinary symptoms right. change as well. they're and intimately so related. They, they are clearly related. We don't totally get it. I assume it's blood flow related. Because yeah, that is a controversy. The ED drugs for a prostate enlargement are not without controversy. <laughs> and But what I've noticed in the prostate cancer world is that when your urination or you urinate better, people tend to think their erectile function is better and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a strong placebo maybe effect there happier. too. Maybe yeah. they're just happier. Yeah. I don't know. But at least that's an option, right? And then the last category of pills I want to talk about, which seem to be popular, I don't know if they're based, based on a lot of research, is these overactive bladder drugs. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. It's, it's common that we will treat obstructive urinary symptoms with, say, an alpha blocker, which relaxes the prostate. But a patient will continue to have urgency, frequency, nighttime urination. Just these, you know, what happens in... in the course of time is that before the bladder loses its function, it becomes hyperfunctional. As it's fighting against the resistance, it, it squeezes more often. So we can take some of that resistance away, huh. but since we don't do such a great job of taking it all away, you're going to be left with these overactive bladder symptoms. And oh, by the way, before you know it, your BPH patient's on three drugs. Right. Um, or maybe he talked you into that fourth one. I, you know, so these drugs are specifically designed to calm the bladder urges uh, and do, do nothing, you know, per se, with the bladder outlet. There are some patients, but, you know, who need just the bladder drugs. But there are plenty of patients, as I said, who be on, you know, prostate pills and bladder pills because we're treating two adjacent organs that are related but don't act the same way. And, you know, we treat them with what they need. Right. Mm -hmm. But you didn't seem really excited about the relaxers. <laughs> You didn't seem really excited about the shrinkers. Um, are you excited? Are you, are you about at the same amount of excitement for the overactive bladder drugs? So there's about six or seven of these drugs. Um, and With all kinds of side effects. All but one of them is, you know, have very many side effects. Dry eyes, dry mouth, constipation, blurry vision. Um, things that people can't live with, you know, they're just they're just untenable. But apart from um, that, but apart perfect. from that, there's one drug sitting out on the far end. That's of course the newest, most expensive, which is pretty well tolerated. Really. Um, so if I have to use one of these drugs and I can figure out a way to get it paid for, I choose the Mirbetric. You know. The Mirbetric. Yeah, Mirbetric is one. the beta three agonist. It's just a different mechanism, but it gets the job done. And you've been happier with that one. I have not personally taken it, but I, my patients seem happier with it. Yeah. <laughs> Touche. Uh, yeah, yeah. But they seem to like it. I think it's just better tolerated. Okay. So we got all these pills you can take, polypharmacy, a lot of these things. And then um, I'll mention briefly, do you use any uh, prostate supplements or do you think most of them work similar to placebo? 
Well, I think the evidence suggests they work similar to placebo, but I also think placebo is a pretty powerful well, tool. Placebo kicks ass. Yeah, 25%. Right? <laughs> it so, does. so the patient comes in and tells me he loves his super beta prostate. I say, more power to you. Now let's do some tests, you know, let's yeah. see, see where you're at. Uh, but I do have a number of patients, and I think there's a there's an element of control, and there's you know the the idea that most patients have about supplements is well they're harmless. You've taught me long ago that the only supplements that are of any value are the ones that have side effects. So <laughs> so I have to be harmful. I have never encouraged people to go out and try you know. Uh, Sal Palmetto or beta cytosterol or, yeah. you know, there's lots of options, probably 20 plus options, pills, little compounded pills with four or five of those things in one pill. I don't even know how we could possibly guide patients, but all I can really say is none has ever outperformed placebo. Is that yeah. still true? I mean, for the most part, I mean, they haven't, but placebo, placebo and these BPH studies have done so damn well right. that I think someone needs to actually patent the placebo for BPH, <laughs> and then you and I would be loaded. We'd be on a Caribbean island someplace. Right. We wouldn't have to do this work anymore. Um, but it's interesting. You have a slide, I know from your presentations, that lists all the different supplements, and so you let people try them and you monitor them, but you're not as... You just don't seem very excited about any of the pills anyway, let's just be honest. Listen, I think I think there's a, a patient early in his disease process who who I start, you know, through an interaction uh, on a on a monitoring program. Let's try a pill because everybody wants to start, you know, most people would actually prefer to start with uh, phyto, you know, therapeutic as yeah. a supplement. Uh, and if they aren't doing that, let's start with a pill and see how it goes. And we'll monitor them, in which case I'm fine with, you know, trying medications as long as some of these side effects that I'm reading about lately don't come into play because some of them are pretty scary. Yeah. But, but years and years, overall pretty safe, you know, so I'm okay with it. I, I guess I can't be overly enthusiastic with it um, because the drugs that, of those drugs we just discussed, that have the greatest impact on the course of BPH, it's the shrinkers, and the shrinkers have the most side effects, right? So right. I, I guess that's my problem. And studies have shown that even without my input, you know, somebody who starts on one of these pills, there's an Italian study, 70% of people stop their BPH pill within a year of starting it. Yeah.